Good morning. I'm so excited for all of you to be here uh, to talk about a really important subject of alternative financing. Uh, I know most of you in this room, but for those of you I do not know, I'm Elizabeth Tzinski. I'm the Director of Programs and Impact for Scale Up Milwaukee. Um, I first want to say thank you to our six panelists for agreeing uh, to be here today to share their expertise on this very important subject of infusing non-traditional capital into growing ventures. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Scale Up Milwaukee, we are an economic development initiative under the Greater Milwaukee Committee. Our main mission is to help companies grow, full stop. And we want that, we want that economic prosperity to be equitable in all uh, realms. Uh, so we are so excited to gain the, the expertise of these wonderful panelists today. Um, so first, uh, I have asked the panelists to prepare a few minutes of remarks just to introduce themselves um, and give some insight into their offerings. So Susan, I think we'll start with you. Okay, you're gonna. I can do it for you. That my, good because I probably messed that up. My twelve ninety nine mm -hmm. clicker from Amazon that arrived last night is not working, so we'll do oh. school, school style. Okay. Um, first of all, I'm really honored to be here and uh, in front of the business owners um, because you guys take the risk, you make it happen, and hopefully we'll, we can partner with you on the road. So MEDC, um, we've been around for 50 plus years, and I, I think you can go to the next slide. Um, we're kind of a quiet um, lender in town. Um, we're a CDFI, so that's a community development financial institution. and. Two of my colleagues here, Errol and Renee, also work for CDFI. So we're, we're a little different in what we do, but we basically lend money and help, help businesses. That's our goal. Um, we primarily lend to for-profit businesses, and usually we work with a bank. Um, usually we have a bank partner, um, and we do a, a second mortgage on a commercial building, or we, we do that gap piece of financing. We can go to the next one. So as I mentioned, we do gap funding. These are some projects we've worked on. The new um, North Avenue Market, um, Pete's Fruit Market, and the Wheelance Bracket. We, we tend to like to work in these <coughs> investing areas and work with people um, you know, that um, are underserved. That's really our focus, but um, Next slide. So this gets into a little detail. There are brochures out there which, which kind of lay this out. But basically, we, we will work on financing with only 10% where a bank might say, you need 20% in. Um, we want you to put some money in. Uh, getting 100% financing is, I don't know if you guys do that, but we don't do that. So um, we want you to have some skin in the game. Um, and we're flexible. Unlike a bank, um, I think you'll find that CDFIs in general are flexible with their terms. We still want you to personally guarantee, so you're, you're your business, and we're going to take personal assets if we need to, like a second mortgage on your house. And please have a, a discussion with your spouse before you come meet with me. <laughs> I've had a little... I've had experiences where it's like, we're not doing that, and it's like, you know, so anyway. <laughs> Next, please. Um, and these are all the things we finance. I mean, it's pretty much everything. I would say what we don't finance, we don't do lines of credit. So if you have um, a business where you are have receivables, so you're providing a service, um, or you're selling a product to a business to business and you're sending an invoice out and now you're waiting for payment but you need a line of credit because you got to make payroll and rent. We don't do that. Um, I don't know if my other colleagues do that but um, that's something hopefully you can get in a bank. Again, we want you to develop a banking relationship but sometimes we all have to you know, be part of that financing package. Alternative. <clears throat> and we also focus on ACRE graduates, so if, if um, you've been uh, selected to go to the ACRE program, which is a real estate development company, uh, real estate uh, training program for um, minorities, um, we will work with you on investment real estate. But we don't really like to do that. That's not our bread and butter. But if, you, if somebody's getting into it and they want to buy a duplex or a four-family, 
um, again, we can be there to help you maybe purchase it, stabilize it, you know, rehab it, stabilize, and then go to the bank and, and get some longer term financing. So, next please. And the, that's, the, that's our team. And they're on the brochure too. So, myself, I've been, I've been in lending since 1983. I've worked at banks, I've worked at several CDFIs, and um, so anyway, give us a call, email any of us with questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Sure. We are going to have plenty of time for questions. We want to kind of do an information dump right now, so. Okay. <laughs> I'm Errol Barnett, I'm Chief Lending Officer at Legacy Redevelopment Corporation in Milwaukee, um, and we're a CDFI as well. Um, and I think you've, you've, you've gotten a little bit of flavor from Sue as to what a CDFI is all about, but the nuts and bolts of it is that, you know, we're lenders that, uh, we're mission lenders. And so um, we try to provide fair, responsible financing to rural, urban, um, Native American, and other communities that mainstream finance doesn't traditionally touch. So these are folks that just can't go to a bank and get a traditional uh, commercial loan or any kind of a loan. Uh, at Legacy Redevelopment, our mission is to provide strategic lending solutions uh, to grow and revitalize communities. Uh, and our vision is to stimulate economic development in Milwaukee. And we also have an office in Racine, which we just opened uh, not too long ago. Um, you know, our, our, our loan products, so describe some of the things that they do, we will do micro loans, uh, working capital lines, and and uh, and loans. So we will do those uh, that uh, yeah, that MEDC won't do, if you will. Uh, we also do equipment uh, lending, uh, inventory. Uh, we will do commercial real estate purchasings and uh, business rehab, um, and uh, we will do uh, financing to subcontractors as well. Um, our process is is pretty much similar to a bank in, in the way that we look at credit and we review credit. You know, I want to see tax returns and financial statements and we'll analyze those and we'll put a write-up together. We have a loan committee that meets uh, on an ad hoc basis and so we present most of those deals to our loan committee to get those approved. Um, one of the things that we don't look at uh, that, that, that a lot of other um, banks will look at is credit scores. Credit scores, we will look at them and we want to make sure that you know, we want to see what kind of trends there are, but it, if you have a low credit score, uh, that won't deter us from, from taking a look at the deal ultimately. So, uh, again, um, kind of stole all the thunder, really, <laughs> from a CDFI. But, you know, one of the things that I've, I've learned, I've only been working with Legacy for the last couple of years. Uh, my background is a commercial lender. Um, I've been a banker for over 40 years and worked uh, at most of the large banks in town. Uh, I divide my career into two segments. Uh, um, one is large banks, um, such as uh, Chase. I worked at Chase. Uh, my last assignment was with the U.S. Bank. And then I also worked with uh, community banks. And there are smaller banks um, that reach out and do things that some of the larger banks won't do. Um, but the real bread and butter of helping in the community actually comes out of the CDFIs. Um, I was in New York last week for the annual CDFI uh, conference uh, put on by uh, OFN. And uh, I was kind of surprised at that what the CDFIs do uh, runs the gamut from making microloans to actually being commercial developers, putting projects, real estate projects together. Um, um, and, I, and so from all over the country, there were like 2,000 participants uh, there that, uh, you know, they, they did it all. Uh, at Legacy, we try to, to look at ourselves as kind of a mini commercial bank. Uh, so we want to be able to give everybody that flavor of coming to us and be able to get something uh, from us that you can't traditionally get from a, a lending institution. So um, that's pretty much what we do at Legacy Redevelopment, and uh, you know, uh, you, you can look us up on the website. I, I'll leave some cards here as well. Uh, and if you want to reach out to me, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about uh, any project that you may be thinking about. Hello again. 
and um, and I know a bunch of you. And, and what's so cool in this space? And Errol and I were just talking to and about the, the CDFIs and how some of the folks who are now at Legacy were at Wibic, and you know, same thing with a bunch of these folks. So a lot of the business owners here, you may have touched all of us, and you should. You all, you definitely should. So this is really great that Elizabeth is bringing us together because we don't compete. Like, oh, you have to go with us. We have. It, whatever makes sense for you, um, and even the bankers, right, Jacob, they come from US, so we want um, all things. So we work part in partnership. Um, and that's actually why I have this slide up here, because um, Kiva is part of, it's a separate entity, but Wibic is its hub, its host organization in Wisconsin. So I'm going to talk a tad bit, not much, about the CDFI, because you guys covered it really well. But I will go over a couple of the slides, because it's easier for me to put those slides. Um, um, so, and we'll see some pe people out here were statewide uh, and similar to um, some of these other organizations. And then we toss in a couple other things. We started 35 years ago as a women's fund. Um, so, back then we just served women. Much more recently, we serve everybody. Um, but we do have some focus in organizations. Um, we're in Milwaukee, but we're statewide. We have some headquarters also in Madison, Racine, Kenosha. Um, Appleton and Lewis is in the cross. So, we want to make sure that we're you know, we've, we've noticed not only urban, rural, you know, and everybody in between. And then again, you know, the, our emphasis, you know, we were talking before about like who people serve. We want to make sure that we're, we're, we are serving the folks who perhaps weren't served by a banker who would say, I, I can't go to a banker. I went to two or three and they're like, uh-uh. So we want to make sure that we um, get there and are good allies of folks who really are really smart business owners and who just need one extra door to open. Um, so we do, um, again, they may not at this point yet be able to go to a bank, or they could. You know, perhaps they did, and they spent all their money, and now they need some other kinds of things. We help the startup existing, just like we were talking, expansion needs. So our lending, and we can certainly share these slides afterwards for sure, um, very similar to what some of the other community development financial institutions, the alternative groups do. We go up to 350. Where then, if you want more, we'll say, go to Susan. They do more, you know. But but Errol and I, we play in a similar space, up to about 350. Yep. So our average loans are about 50,000. So again, one of us, whichever makes the most sense. Um, you'll notice that her rate said 5.25, and Jacob and other bankers' rate will say five or six percent. We are a bit higher. Like oh my god, but it is so much better than a payday loan, which we had folks come to us and say, I am paying. You know, places that you would recognize. I am paying $100 in interest because I have all of these payday kinds of things or other things, or they needed to just get some because they had to pay their employees and they had a large restaurant. So we are help, we, we help them uh, consolidate that for folks. So this 9.25, while well, it seems high, um, you get a little bit extra with that. You get, um, we'll get to what you get with that, but you get a few extra little perks with that. But again, we'll take a risk. And then we can graduate you out to a bank or somebody else a little bit later. Again, we talked about our terms. You have to be somebody. You can't be a real estate person who's just buying properties and be like, hey, hey, can I buy a building? And you can buy 10 of them. We want you actively involved in that business. Nothing wrong with those other folks, but you have to be actively involved. It's similar to what the other CDFIs can do, work, working capital. We do lines as well. You typically have to rest the line, which means after that first year, let's say you have a line of credit of 15000 We have this COVID fast track. You want to pay it down, and then you can re-up it again. So we do have some lines of credit, too, mostly term though. Uh, and we typically don't do real estate. That's, again, where we say go to a partner or a bank or go to MABC, uh, unless it makes sense. Uh, and then the coolest thing, and we have two of our former cool SBCs here, small business consultants, Athena and Greg, were one. Um, and so they have great expertise in serving a business. So with that 9.25% interest, you will get a person who can guide you through the life of your loan. They will call you, you will call them, you're like, oh my goodness, what's going on? Or they'll say, hey, I'm seeing your financials look a little wonky, let's talk. Um, so you will have somebody um, who will collect a lot of forms from you, we'll do some other information just so we can gather information, um, and but then they'll connect you with their other clients and they'll connect you with other people. That's really the cool piece about some of these. Um, they're more like a case manager. They have about 100 clients. Um, so throughout the state, they've kind of spread about, but they will talk to you and make sure that you've got um, what's going on if you need some support. Um, and then another piece we'll talk later is this, we partnered with another um, CDFI in, was it Michigan, or Michigan, who um, 
knew that business owners cannot always meet during the day or at night or wherever. So sometimes they just need 15 minutes at 11 o'clock at night. We have a 24 hour online tool called Initiate. And you don't have to actually have be a low client to get that. That was initially how it was. If you have that extra, there can be some other special things that folks can um, join in with us if you're really entrenched with us. Um, replication process, we'll talk about that if you really want to sit down. Um, but it is long for any of anybody. If you're going to say, I want some money, make sure you have at least two or three months. Do not sign a lease right away, you know, all of that. A lot of you guys have probably been in business, you're looking for things. It is a long process. We take a long time. Our CDFIs, we will look, we all we do look at credit. You don't have to have a specific credit score. But if you're in the 500, 600, 700, 800s, we will work with you. But we want you to begin paying back your other loans. So if you have other debt, we're a lender, right? We need to be paid back. We want you to have payment plans. We're going to maybe talk to, have you talked to Sarah's with um, Riverworks? She has a financial clinic over in her organization. Let's talk to them and get your professional credit restored so then you can take on this debt, see if it does make sense. Um, so there are some important pieces that we want to work. People who come with the, to us, oftentimes it's their first loan. They've been in business five, six years. They're like, oh my god, now I'm strapped. So we want to make sure you help to kind of understand that. SPDC will talk about getting loan ready. Um, so that's that. Kiva. Um, OK. This is the most exciting part. So maybe I'll come back to talk about Kiva after these guys talk. Or no, you know, go right ahead while you're on a roll. So who knows about Kiva? I know a few of you guys do. That's so cool. You guys can tell me that. So for the other folks who don't, and we can share some story. Rita, um, did yes, yes. You see one of our Kiva loan folks here. Zero to uh, zero percent, which is so cool. Because when we recognize that not everybody needs thirty percent, you might need less. And why pay the closing costs and our 9.25% interest and all of that. So we have partnered with Kiva, a cool organization um, that is founded um, in San well, Uganda is where it started, but in San Francisco, and so it's all very cool. Um, so Kiva, what you want to know about Kiva is that it is a step stepping stone. And again, people all over. COVID, we recognized that even if you were an existing business, you still needed some of that 0%, and you might not have been bankable at certain points. So then people do go to Kiva at all stages of their growth. And then, um, so it could be for anybody. We'll talk about the process. I do have some flyers out there. But the important thing to know is you're not just acting, asking one entity. You are asking first your friends to make sure, because they're the people um, in this first stage, they're the folks who, it's a private stage, they're the folks who are gonna say, yes, I will lend to you, and you're going to pay me back. So it's called a private stage for that reason. Instead of giving us, giving Kiva a business plan and your financials, which are important, because you're asking for a lower amount of dollars, these people are your underwriters. These people are the ones who are gonna say, yep, we know this person, this business is gonna succeed. Um, so they have a private stage. So there's a private stage, and then there's a public stage. Once you get to that public stage, that's when this magic happens, where you will have, I had a whisper pop yesterday, it was awesome. Um, you will have maybe up to, this, this group had 155 lenders. They knew probably about 12 of them. They, Kiva assigns you a certain number. Let's say, for example, you know, they, well, they wanted 15, they got 15,000, so they probably had 20, 25 people they had to ask. But, there was 120 some people that they did not know that went to them from around the world. Um, the other key piece for sure is that does, is not where it ends. That is not where it ends. So your private fundraising, they, get, they got their 15,000, that's awesome, they did what they needed to do, they are paying back. That next month, <coughs> you pay back. You do not pay back 155 people individually, you will pay back once a month, and then Kiva takes care of getting it to the rest. So it's a very cool concept. Um, we can talk about it. Here's the magic. <coughs> I think that would be it. Cool. Here's some information, and then we'll go after. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning, all. Uh, my name is Dave Zockman. I represent Angel Investing in, in the group here. There are about seven, I think, Angel Investment Groups in the state of Wisconsin. I think Angels deserve their name. Uh, Angel Investing is less about making money than it is doing good and having fun. So we are very much supportive of the community. Here in Milwaukee, there are two Angel Groups. 
Uh, one is called Milwaukee Venture Partners. I belong to a group called Golden Angels. Golden Angels was formed out of Marquette back in 2002, thus the name, taking from Golden Eagles, that's where that came from. We spun out of the university around 2011. There are 100 accredited investors in the group, and thus uh, the adage, no one of us is as smart as all of us, so I'm not particularly bright myself, so in terms of making <laughs> investing, I rely on risk being mitigated by 99 partners who are much smarter than I am in a whole bunch of different areas. We also have 50 associates that are not accredited investors, but are partners, if you will, in terms of helping us do diligence. They're folks who want to learn about uh, in angel investing and maybe become an angel investor down the road. I have personally about 25 personal investments through the organization, some private equity, but mostly through the Golden Angels because of the mitigation of risk. That we focus on innovation-driven entrepreneurship, meaning highly scalable, because angel investing is very early stage. Uh, we think of it as second stage or seed stage, where first stage is typically bootstrapping, friends, family, self-funded yourself. Now I'm ready to go to the next stage. I have a highly scalable business please contact us. So even if you're not a good fit for our organization, there's a lot of coaching that goes on, a lot of good networking we can help you with, so a lot of mentoring. So by all means, even if you don't have maybe the scalable business you think, we're happy to talk to you, do some due diligence, coach you and give you some direction and maybe come back in six months after you acquire a couple of customers. Most of our bets, and we think of them literally as bets because 95% go to zero, of course, over time. So it being highly speculative, we know that maybe one, maybe out of 10, will fund all of the rest. But we do, we are a resource in the community. I encourage you to reach out to us. I have some handouts here. Reach out to me personally. The application process is simply go to the website and send us a pitch deck. We do get about 30 applications a month, and the process is that's so a one a day, literally. The process is that the vetting is done. We focus on businesses in Wisconsin, scalable businesses. We have particular portfolio interests. They are educational technology. For example, we have a significant investment in the Milwaukee company Fiveable that you may be aware of. We're interested in any kind of technology. You may be aware of Front Desk, which is a Milwaukee company recently valued at $54 million. Uh, that's a couple of local guys, Kyle Weatherly and Jesse DePento. We have a bet in uh, a pharmaceutical company called Promentis, which was a collaboration between the chemistry departments at UWM and Marquette that we've been funding for about 11 years now. Uh, Curate out of Madison, if you knew them, they're now part of a SPAC. We've been involved in that investment. So we do dabble around in a lot of areas, and by all means, send us a pitch deck. We're happy to look at it. Thank you, Dave. You're welcome. Perfect. Greg, you're next. Okay. Good morning. My name is Greg Martin. I'm a business consultant with the UWM SBDC program. And what the SBDC program does is we work with entrepreneurs and, and small businesses to help them grow and to, and to develop, of course. And we do that through um, our consulting services. And those services um, include assisting clients with helping develop business plans, projections, marketing um, um, presentations, um, also um, assisting our clients with um, finding resources that are available in the community. And those resources could be um, connecting them with different professionals um, like accountants, um, attorneys, um, real estate brokers, and also other resources um, through our partnerships that we've developed uh, through the years. And those partnerships include firms like um, MEDC and Legacy Redevelopment Corp, and of course WIBIC, um, but also other CDFIs that are located in the community and um, traditional banks that might be uh, willing and able to um, loan money and work with uh, startup businesses. Because as I'm sure a lot of you know that um, the banking community in general um, does not like working with startup businesses, but over the years we've been able to uh, develop relationships with banks that, um, that are willing to um, operate in that um, arena. Um, also, we, um, we work with our clients in, in other, um, other um, resources and developing other resources, whether it's um, looking to sell their business or acquire other businesses. So we've um, developed a, 
uh, relationships with business evaluators and um, other resources to help them sell and acquire businesses, locally owned businesses. Um, but all in all, our main goal is to help you develop. So whether it's something, uh, resources that we have or knowledge that we have, we, we, um, we um, deploy that or we also find um, those that can help you. Thank you very Thank much, Greg. <laughs> I'm the executive director of Bright Star Wisconsin. Uh, Bright Star is, is kind of a unique animal, not just in southeastern Wisconsin or Wisconsin, but across the country. We are first of its kind. We, we are a 501c3 charitable organization that operates and functions and acts every which way like a venture fund. Uh, and so uh, just, just to be clear on this, we do not grant money. We don't have certain parameters. We act like a venture fund. It's just money into us, instead of invested in us, is donated for the good of the Wisconsin tech community. And that means that I don't have to pay back investors. That when I get a return off of the entrepreneurs, it stays within technically a foundation, which then I roll into more and more tech entrepreneurs across the state for the good of the state forever and ever. Right? This, this is a legacy thing. Uh, we uh, have easily been the most active when it looks at new investments, the most active investor in the state uh, since 2014 when, when we started investing. We have 70, 75 companies in the portfolio. We're industry agnostic. We normally do uh, 150 dollars to $250,000 in investment uh, virtually always within a syndicate with, with angel investors or other venture capitalists. Uh, but just a, a very unique model uh, that leverages really the connections all over the state to find some really cool tech opportunities. Uh, the track record has been great. Uh, the first two unicorns in the state's un history, which is startup companies that were valued north of a billion dollars, were companies we invested in, in in our first year in Shine in Janesville and, and Fetch Rewards out of Madison. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess I would say I'm happy in, in the question and answer to talk Bright Star, but just for the, the sake of continuing being different, I can play the the old curmudgeon, <laughs> evil vulture capitalist at the end of it. But but we we do normally invest at the the angel that that precedes seed if it's a light A. Um, but again, just because our model is is more of a fun type model where it's not a uh, hundred people. Uh, where it's, here's the idea, and then you pass the hat. Who, who wants to do this? And if you accumulate a certain level and make the investment, if I like the opportunity, I present it to the investment committee, and it's a go, more like a venture fund. Um, so with, with that said, again, happy to play that other role. <laughs> so, you do what, what feels right to you. Yeah. Let's give all of our panelists a quick round of applause. It's not going to be coming up here at 830 um, and talking finance, but here we are. Um, so thank you so much for, uh, for adding that insight and expertise uh, for our whole audience. I have a list of questions to start us off, but as most of you know who have been in our rooms before, we're a pretty casual group. So I invite you guys to raise hands, interrupt, jump in um, with any questions or comments um, that you may have. Uh, so I really don't think that we could have picked a better time for this panel. Uh, we are in the middle of our SPARK program, which is for growing minority and women-owned companies, and of course there's a financing component to that curriculum. Um, but last week, the Milwaukee Business Journal uh, published a lengthy article um, entitled The Flight of the Banks. Uh, we've included some copies um, out there if you want to take a look at it. Um, it's a really interesting insight in the consolidation of the banking system over the years and how that has affected companies and uh, most, uh, most negatively minority and women owned companies. Um, in fact, in that article they interviewed a few Spark alum, a few who graciously joined us today, both Rashad and Brandon. Thank you for coming and providing your insight and questions as well. Um, so really, my first question to the panelists is, what trends have you seen over the years, pandemic aside, pandemic included, about the entrepreneurs or business owners that are approaching you for funding? How are they different? How are they even different? What are their needs looking like? Can you answer, uh, give any insight into that? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for, for banks, um, 
you know, they serve a, they serve a niche, and it's, um, I, I'm a, I worked at First Star, if anyone remembers that name, back in the 90s. Um, you know, it's very evolved, and it's, smaller deals are much more of a credit score process. Um, some banks won't even work with us in a secondary position. Um, and there's fewer and fewer community banks. Um, we, you know, we have our, our referral sources to, I can think of two banks in town that um, I could call to see if they were interested in a deal. So it is harder to find that. Um, but they're regulated. We're not regulated, the advice, and that's, that's the biggest difference. Um, you know, they have bank examiners come in and, you know, if you restructure a loan, it, it gets called something and now it's on this column on the balance sheet. We, we can be more flexible. So like during COVID, and I'm sure you guys did the same thing. We did a lot of restructures or, or no payments for three months. Let's see what happens or interest only. So we're, we were able to do that very efficiently and, and really help out. And that's what makes us unique. But I, I think that, um, you know, the environment, I, I read the article and, and I agreed with some of it, but I think there there is, um, you know, I, I don't agree with all, uh, all the comments because I worked in banking and at Farwell at North and and the peak, my coworkers, we want to help a business owner. We don't, we just, it's got to make sense. And we want to be in underserved communities, but but it's like that, I don't know how to say this. We're, we're focusing on it, but we've never been like, uh, driven, I guess, from the standpoint of, we want to be out there, we want to help, but you can't make people come. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's some intimidation. I know people used to be nervous coming in to see me at the bank. I'm like, really, knock it off, you know? <laughs> um, no, because I, and, you know, it, it's, we're having a conversation. And I think there still is some intimidation. I, I think a lot of the bankers, and I know you're a banker over here, so I'm sorry. Hey, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, like, oh, I'm going to talk to, in the old days, you had the blue suit on, and, you know, it was very different. Um, and it's a little more casual today. But, um, you know, they want to, that's how they make money, that's how we make money to pay, in our case, you know, the rent and, and the, utilities and the payroll. So we want to lend money. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but... That's okay. We can go with the stream of consciousness. It's all, it's all you know, just keep making fun of bankers. <laughs> Deshaun, Jared, and I, our co-worker, the Scale Up team, uh, we were talking the other day that like we're going to have to have a part two where the bankers can come and rebut everything that is said. This will not turn into a pile on. This is just no. talking about the difference no, and the, the, the thing is, we work with bankers. Mm -hmm. Most of our, our bread and butter deal is you go find a bank, and you found a building, for instance, and but you have limited cash to put a down payment on it, and a bank might say, you know, we need 20 to 25 percent, and they're like, yeah, well, I have about 10. Um, and so they'll do, the bank does a 50 percent loan to value, and what that means is the building's worth 100, and you're only borrowing 50 from them. They love that, right? We come behind them in a second mortgage on a first of commercial real estate, which is unheard of. No bank will do, ever do that. Um, and we do that 40,000 piece, and you put the 10 in. Um, and we may build into that project, you know, the, the cost of the building, and then you have some re renovations, rehab. There might be some working capital or legal fees and closing costs. We build that all in that in that budget. So we do like our bank partners a lot. Um, it's just sometimes we have had, I would say in the last year or so, we've done some larger deals like between up to two million because they, the banks won't do it. And these are specifically underserved minority borrowers that we're doing these deals with. So again, if the deal makes sense, we want to be there. We want a banking relationship to happen. We think it's important as a business grows. But sometimes it's just not, they're not ready 
And so we hope in three years when your note comes due, you know, there's a, there's a track record now and we can we can make some introductions to some bankers, so. Thank you, Susan. Um, I'd invite other comments, any trends you've seen. Well, I think one of the, the biggest um, differences now as opposed to um, what took place in the past is that there are no minority-owned banks um, left in the city That's of Milwaukee. Um, 10, 15 years ago, you had North Milwaukee Legacy Bank, who's, and their mission was to specialize in the uh, lending to minority, uh, minority community. And they are no, um, no longer around, but the local CDFIs have, have, have been working to kind of fill that void. Organizations um, like Legacy Redevelopment Corp, MEDC, WIBIC, of course, and Northwest CDC have been very active in that space and providing that gap and um, with the mission of helping um, uh, minority businesses grow. So there, there is definitely, um, there's definitely players in that space, but because they're, they don't have that bank building and the deposits, I don't think people know about them as much. So, and, um, so thanks, Greg. That was a, because you had been at a, you know, we had some folks at WIBIC who were uh, lenders at banks, and a lot of the folks that uh, were lenders were, and so I'm, I'm going to try to change the, the verbiage here. So, as most of this audience and most of the world, global majority. So, we're on all try global majority instead of minority, because it's really what we are. Um, I'm the minority, you know, as far as what's going on. But, but I think in the banking world, we're like, oh, where I was at Wibbeck, we're like, oh, we're all, I mean, I had, we had more people of global majority, people of color in our space, in our working space, and then also in our client base. So I think it's what people see. To your point, we are not out there as much um, in a bank building or something like that, but it's what people see. And um, in some of the banking worlds that, that I've, been through or some of the different community things that I've been at, I'm like, oh, of course we're all here. And then when you go into a different space, you're like, where are they? So from my perspective, I can walk into any room, like, okay, I'm fine. And for other people's perspective, that probably isn't the case. I, I, I don't know. I can't speak. I can be a good ally. Um, so when you know you guys are saying, where are the, where are the banks and you know what this is? I haven't read that article, um, and I will. It's right out there. I will. I a few copies <laughs> last night. But, but anecdotally, as far as some of these people, what people need to see and what people are seeing, when I took on the Kiva role, um, and I really represent Kiva West Dallas because there were some dollars that the city of West Dallas found to have some matching dollars. And so the um, guy there at the Economic Development, he said, we have people here, West Dallas is one of the most welcoming for so many different groups. We want this, this is our priority. This is our priority to get folks out there, to get sponsors, to get people back, to get money into the hands of folks who would not get it. They have people who are um, immigrants. They have folks who, and especially in West Dallas and other parts of the community, uh, a lot of bilingual, a lot of other um, folks who don't go, haven't gone to a bank. But what's interesting, when I went, most of my WIBIC work before was the Greater Milwaukee, um, more in some of the different neighborhoods. And besides U.S. Bank and a few others, there's few banks. There's so few banks. A few years ago, Town Bank did come in, um, and so Town was trying to make a difference. But most were leading. Most were leading, like in a lot of the um, communities and leading. When I had my bank list for West Dallas to make some partnerships and things, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's like 50 banks uh, just within 10 blocks. That is not the case in Milwaukee. It is very interesting. So. Um, you know, so I met that relationship. I had the relationship with Jacob because he was out of West Dallas, but you know he's representing his way. But he's a community person. Not bankers. It's not like they don't care. They're just not positioned in that spot to care as uh, to to be with folks as much. So I think it needs to be more strategic. And I think that's where some of the we fit in. But I think we need to make that demand of some of the bankers and some of the other institutions as well. And I will put a pitch out for bilingual. We we need more bilingual. Period. Um, and Hmong as well, it's the Hmong Chamber, and I mean other folks. So I think as far as banks, they have a different perspective. They need, they have bigger dollars. They're going, what did you say, two point, you know, I used to work in the 2.5 million space, you know, now you're in the smaller space. That's a, that aren't that many, there are a few, but I, I think it's just, it's perspective and what's, it's what you see, and it's what's around you, it's what's in the air around you. Mm -hmm. I've got three. 
three trends. Go ahead. No, I just been sitting here listening. Uh, and again, I'm coming from the early stage tech space, so early stage tech ecosystem. Uh, first one, and I'll just look at the past 10 years. There has been, and, and this is a great thing, there's, there's been uh, more of a, there's a, a different level of sophistication in the Milwaukee area. And that's uh, whether it's the expectations of the entrepreneurs coming in already being familiar with the space to the groups and the organizations that are geared up in the area to, and, and the events and things like that. Now, obviously, we're not the coast, right? But you're starting to see some of this develop. Uh, the, the second one um, is for, for so long, cry when I first started this, I mean, you'll appreciate this one. It was always the worry, the frustration. We, we, we have a great angel network here. We don't have a lot of VCs, you know, that, that bigger, that take the A round, the B round, the C round, that we'd invest in these companies and then inevitably they'd get moved to Boston or San Francisco. Over the past 10 years, that, that trend, I, have, I don't have that worry anymore. I don't have that frustration anymore. The coasts have realized the middle of the country is a damn good place to have a business, right? People are happier. Cost of living is better. Uh, in fact, what we're actually seeing is a reverse trend because of the pandemic. So a lot of the problem my portfolio companies have is hiring people here because now, let's say I had a startup up in Green Bay, right? And, and we need to develop software. That software programmer who is in Green Bay, sure as heck is going to be working for that startup. Now they can work for the Boston company from their Green Bay living room and get paid 80% more. And so you're actually seeing that trend. And so there's, there's a variety of things here in Wisconsin we just need to get ahead of because we have a, a huge, we already had a talent gap issue. It's only going to be made worse. Uh, and and this, this is desperate, valuable stuff for our startup tech community. And the third one, and girls, I want to hear you cheering. I see way more women founders, women CEOs of tech businesses than 10 years ago. Heck, this room is pretty evenly split. 10 years ago, this, this would be a dude fest. <laughs> And, and, and there's tons of reasons. I mean, that's a whole other panel for that. And, and that's fantastic. It's just fresh ideas, fresh energy. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's awesome. And, and that's a cool trend over the past 10 years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's like really inspiring. Uh, would invite any other comments about other trends? If it, yeah, I'll, I'll mention a trend I've, I've noticed, and I'm going to go back even pre-pandemic, back to the Great Recession in 2008. In the angel world, we used to make bets on concepts more, mm -hmm. and we would lose a lot of money betting on concepts. So what we've learned today, as different from banks, is that it's not, you don't need collateral, you need a customer. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've learned that the single necessary and sufficient condition for a business is a paying customer, emphasis on paying. And, and I've noticed that, that trend in, in the entrepreneurship world, that the folks who are coming to us now, they have a good idea, but they also have a customer. So somebody's recognizing the value of what they do and it's paying for it, and that mitigates our risk greatly. So if, if you really have developed customers, somebody who's actually paying you and sees value, even if it's two, mm -hmm. we're gonna be much more interested in seeing you. And I think the ecosystem has recognized yeah. that as well, that yeah. I, I gotta have a customer. Mm -hmm. And that actually goes for even the smaller deals as well. You know, we have folks who come like, I think I can do this, I wanna do this, in order for it to get over the hump and maybe to get to a loan committee who's gonna say, are we gonna invest 50, 60? Do you, we sometimes say, do you have, you know, a, a letter of intent, you know, we have dump trucks or somebody like who's going to buy some of your things? Have you test marketed? Have you done some of this stuff? Don't give it all away. Not that way. I don't mean giving it all away, test marketing, but who is who's purchasing and who's buying. So that's a, that is in our world too, in the smaller world. Great. Um, I'd love to piggyback on, on those last two comments, Dave um, and Renee. Um, in your experience, what makes the most successful entrepreneurs, the, the business owners that you work with? Obviously, Dave mentioned having a paying customer or client. What other, uh, what other uh, I don't want to use the word trends, what other characteristics, attributes in your line of work, in your experience, have you seen gains the, the, the most success? I think it's, it's someone that, uh, that really does their homework that uh, is, is, is prepared to, to, to handle almost any eventuality. Um, 
<coughs> one of the things that that I that, that I'm big on when when a customer comes in for the first time is that business plan, and and I want to see that there was some thought in that plan, uh, not only in just the financials and the projections, because anybody who puts a projection together is, is always going to show that you know my bottom line is great, uh, my sales are taking off every year, uh, and so what I what I really want to see in that market plan. That, that business plan is a market analysis uh, okay. so that they really understand uh, the space that they're entering and, and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, and so, you know, most entrepreneurs, if, if, you're, if you deal with them for the first time, they have a plan that's going to work and, you know, they make millions of dollars. Um, but I really want to narrow that down. Uh, I want to see that they understand what happens if um, rates rise. Um, um, what happens if they don't get the kind of uh, sales response that they're actually looking for in their projections? Um, I just want them to be prepared um, for almost any eventuality. And w when I see those kinds of deals, I really want to work with those people. Um, what I see right now is that we get a lot of entrepreneurs that are calling. Um, they have an idea that's going to work, um, but they haven't really done the, the homework that's needed. Um, and so there's, from my standpoint, there's a lot of technical assistance that, that I have to provide at that particular juncture. Uh, and that takes us away from the focus, if you will. Um, but, you know, that's needed. Um, we'll do that. I'm glad there are guys like Greg who can help folks with business plans. Uh, I'm going to send you a few of those people that I'm talking about uh, just to, to help out. But uh, just be prepared and uh, ready to, to deal. Um, those are the kind of things that I would like to see. And there's another resource um, that we just kind of rediscovered last week. I don't know if you're from, if, are people following the Milwaukee Public Library? It sounds funny, but the Milwaukee Public Library, has anybody gone recently to the Milwaukee Public Library downtown? Okay, so here's my incentive. They just opened up last week their business commons space, and they've had for several years, if you are a Milwaukee City resident and you get a library card, you have access to their databases that talk about market analysis. Because some people say, well, you know, and then people are like, How, I don't know where to get that information. And we do have business plan classes, but they don't dig deep into your specific industry. They'll help you write that, but you have to do the research and you have to figure that out. So, you know, where to find that? And one great resource is the Milwaukee Public Library. Hermione and her team um, have these databases that are available and they will walk you through. They have all these things that will go to the granular street level public information of, what customers are here, who's here, who's there, who's not. If you're a Milwaukee County resident, you don't have to be Milwaukee City, but you can still get gain access to some of these other databases as well. So I would definitely look up Milwaukee um, Public Library to get some of these great databases. Um, and that is becoming, you know, people are like, I want to learn, but how? So I think what we need to do is to help them figure some of that out to get them loan ready. You know, the SBTC, was, Greg was talking about the different resources and the partners. You have to bring in a lot of people on your team. So I think what trait for the, for that we find that we want people to say is that they're open to that coaching to be able to say, yeah, I don't, you know, I, I know this piece and I, I better build some people around and I want to know how to get some of that information and, and where to access it. And then once you say, here it is, then they then are persistent in getting at it. Mm -hmm. So somebody who's going to just then say, okay, what's next? There's 10 doors that slammed. Someone's not calling me back, which we sometimes takes us you know, a while, but they're going to keep getting at that, that information. And entrepreneurs, they do. I mean, they fight through. Um, but it's just, it's just that information. Mm -hmm. I will like piggyback. Um, she said way better, but I, um, uh, it gets into humility. Um, you know, everyone has certain things that they're good at, right? And your skill set. And, you know, you you have to recognize what you're good at and what you're not. And you need to fill that with professionals. And just been doing this for too long, the people that, oh, I know, or that's not that big of a deal, or they're kind of assessing what how they think it, they will fail, okay? Because the people that have the humility, okay, you know, we'll give them direction. We're not going to do the work. We're going to say, you need to do this. You need to go get the market research. They go and do it. Not, oh, I think that, that you know, again, it gets into digging in, being open to listening to professionals. And then the next thing is accounting. And we struggle with this because we wanted to do, like, accounting clinics 
um, you know, maybe bring in some students to assist because the problem is we need to know how you're doing and you yep. really want to know how you're doing. Um, you know, if you don't run your business, well, I have money in the checkbook. Well, that's like the kid goes, well, there, I went to the ATM, there was money in my account, right? Um, but all these checks were written. I know it's different now, I'm dating myself, but <laughs> you probably don't even own a check, um, <laughs> right? But point being, accounting and there's different levels of cost on that. Um, and do you really want to be spending your time doing QuickBooks? Uh, maybe you don't like doing it, so you'd rather be on the sales side. So guess what happens? It doesn't get done. And then you need to borrow money, or you, you can't assess. You know, um, you know, what did my margin look like last month? Um, you know, where, where can I you know, look at expense trimming if need be? And so it is such a critical tool. It is so critical, and I think that's the, one of the biggest things we see with business owners. Yeah, I get the shoebox, and then I say, go to my accountant at the end of the year, and they do the tax return. That, that's not. But how do we get people? <laughs> <laughs> Have we done it? At least you keep it in the shoebox. That's OK. Have she sits next to two accountants who are like <laughs> cringing. So how do okay, we you guys get people? <laughs> How do we get entrepreneurs to understand how important that is and there's value in paying for that service? Because a good accountant will, if you're not seeing it, they might go, what happened here? You had this big check for whatever. Like they'll call it out, they'll help them understand it. So I find as a, as a lender that's our biggest struggle and and then they want to borrow money, and we're like, well, we need updated financials. Oh, yeah, I have my tax return from 2021. Uh, no, we need something from this year. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's almost okay. Mm -hmm. So um, this becomes a struggle then. It's like, I don't know how your business is doing. And then it's like, do you know how your business is doing? Go ahead, Todd. Uh, so types of entrepreneurs. Yes. Right? Uh, I want to go back. Market validation is the key. Beyond that, you know, you, and I bet you everybody up here would, would say this, you bet on the jockey, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just want to ask this room, who here considers themselves an entrepreneur? Nice. You're all idiots. <laughs> no, you're not. You're right no but, 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 but listen to me. It's an irrational decision. Everybody who just raised their hands, if you guys move forward with what you're doing, what you're putting on the line, yourself, your family, your friends, your community, knowing the most of you, it's not going to work out the way you want. Some of you might get divorced because of this. You guys are going to face financial hardships. And so how do you deal with an irrational person and figure out if they can make a rational decision? That they are going to stick with it. They're going to overcome obstacles and problem solve. In a, in a stressful environment, they can look at something, and even if, though it's their baby idea, say, you know what? I gotta kill the baby. It's tough stuff to do. And you gotta pick up on that as an investor on can this person actually get it done? Do I believe they're going to do it? And the second part of that, what excites me from an entrepreneur, and it comes to the preparation side, and I always give this example. They say what you know, you, you have the whole cast and the, and the crew, and they're sitting on a scene of Star Wars, and George Lucas would come in and they say it's as if he was there. It's as if he had heard the machinery and smelled the smells and, and heard the cheers or the blaster fires. It's as if he was there relaying it as a story. You as the entrepreneur need to go to everybody up on this panel and tell the story of your successful business five, ten years down the road as if you've lived it. And you tell the obstacles and everything you faced and how you overcame it, what you tried, what you learned from it, what broke through the numbers, and when you hit the numbers, what happened in the marketplace and the trend lines. You come in with that and able to tell that story, you're going to have everybody sit up a little straighter on this panel and say, this is somebody I want to work with, this is somebody I want to bet on, even though they're an idiot. <laughs> you're not an idiot. You're brave. You're going to turn back to Absolutely. Say, God bless you I'm all. Brave. God bless you all. <laughs> but, but, but accept who you are yeah. and come in. Come in. Well, I think that also speaks to the humility that 
that ha and have it. And, you know, I think it's a bit of both. I think, you know, all like when people come up to me and they have 10 ideas, I'm like, oh my goodness, you are an entrepreneur. I could not, I am not that brave. You know, so an entrepreneur is someone who has like, would what 90% of other folks would be like, no way, I would never ever do that. So you have to have some of these. Um, Something's off no, up here. It's, not off. it's good. Make but, it work it to your advantage. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there are folks who will take risks that somebody else will not. And you guys know it. I mean, you've talked to your family members and they're like, what are you doing? You're like, I don't know. Uh-uh. I'm still going to do it. Now, that doesn't mean that like you're going to nothing, you know, like you're going to start a restaurant and you've never worked back at a house. I mean, so there are things that you guys would be like, uh-uh. I mean, people have told me all this stuff. I may be off a bit, but good, and I'm going to just make this still happen. So, so brave and humility and a bit Confidence, of um, humility, preparedness, know your numbers, inner anxiety. Yeah. Go ahead, Dave. Steve Jobs always said passion and perseverance. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I believe that an entrepreneur is one who works 80 hours a week to avoid working 40. <laughs> let, let me throw in domain expertise as well. I'm a believer in mastery. So the concept of mastery is 10,000 hours. Uh, a master pianist has got 10,000 hours of practice. So it, to become an entrepreneur and really identify a problem that can be solved uniquely, you pretty much have to master some domain and then be willing passionately to persevere. And I'll add one more point, as to get over the negative stereotype in our culture associated with sales. Because mm -hmm. nobody gets paid till somebody sells something. And you will find that as, a, as an entrepreneur, a solopreneur, with a partner, 50, 60% of what you're gonna be doing is selling what you do. You can't go out and hire somebody to do the selling for you in a small company. I believe in the founder as the chief sales officer. So get over it. We're all in sales today. It's your it's your lifeblood. It's 24-7. Again, it is like having a kid. This is your baby. The concept of 24-7 doesn't hit you until you have a kid. This is that. But it's not just selling the product. It's you're selling a banker. You're selling an investor. You're selling a key hire you need to make that's someone that's going to take a risk on you because they have an added domain experience and you desperately need it. Sell. That is the perfect segue to the boot camp that we have coming up in about three weeks that is on B2B sales strategy. Mm -hmm. But I will table that for now because I want to make sure that we're answering all the questions um, of our audience. I don't want to be up here asking all the questions and talking. So what other questions do you guys have? <clears throat> <laughs> this is a big information dump yes. and that's why we're so happy that our panelists came prepared and are willing to share their expertise um i guess if, if there's oh go ahead so the kiva is you know more of that kind of crowdfunding model and you know that model has surfaced as you know a more popular model as of late particularly in like the high, high highly scalable business okay. realm just curious about anybody's opinion on WeFunder and Republic and we those types them of platforms. Yeah, we do. Um, the WeFunder is, is a really great one. Um, somebody who used to work with Kiva, she would often recommend that as well. So the crowd-based platforms, and again, it's really challenging for someone who's like, oh, I just want the money, and it's not a grant, and it's not, but you do have to have that um, commit, commitment and community. And you know about selling, you have to sell yourself. And we say to folks in that private stage, because it is it's it's around. You're asking folks to participate in your business in that growth. And some people are like, oh, I don't I don't have ten people I can ask, or I don't want to ask. But I said, that's you're a business owner. You you got to you know you've got to do that. So it definitely is good practice for that. But we love all the other um, platforms. But we often caution if they just went off a, a platform, don't ask too soon because you're going to be asking your initial community again. Now with Kiva it's easy because you're low dollars, it's not as large as some of the other things. So you're only maybe asking 10 to 20 to 30 people depending and then it goes out to the world. But that um, crowd based community will get a little like you're asking again, you're asking again, you feel like an insurance, you know, what, what, what. Um, so but we love, all, we love all of them. But don't do two at the same time. We really recommend just doing one crowd based uh, now we've had other folks like Truman, people have heard of Truman, right, Maggie? Um, 
who's fucking fresh. He has like three or four Kiva loans. At a, he just revolved to the next one. Okay, finished, went again, went again, went again. And that's okay. He's got a great base of folks. I mean, to answer your question, if we, we don't mind other ones. We fund our, we think those are great. From a, from a different perspective, from like the venture based, equity based investment. Yeah, piece I, do you yeah. know about the crowdfunding kind of thing? On that? The original crowdfunding where people are just get money in exchange for a t shirt, so, you know, so be it. I get nervous when it's the crowd investing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because uh, you, you are potentially, and this is still, I mean, relatively early in this, so we'll see how this all plays out. But, you know, every, every single person on the cap table, is a headache waiting to happen. It's liability, right? It's litigation, all all that wrapped up and and to potentially have that much exposure, uh, I, it's it's tough when it's it's sitting there. Uh, when geez, why why couldn't you have just raised angel money if it's that good of an idea? It, it, it makes me nervous. I haven't. I can't think I've done one. Have you guys looked at one that actually had? I, oh, I I think a lot of most investors would steer away from that. I, I know that there's one, and perhaps Elizabeth, um, because he wasn't able to be here, um, about Fund Milwaukee, yes. which has actually kind of done a bit of both, the mm -hmm. equity as well as more recent ones, pitches that I've gone to, people have offered debt financing, mm -hmm. so perhaps you can touch on Fund Milwaukee. Sure, sure. I actually sit on the board for, for Fund Milwaukee, um, which is crowd funding, crowd investing. Um, we do both. Uh, loans and equity. I would say the loans far outweigh uh, percentage-wise the the equity. Um, but it's another avenue to explore. There's always risk. There's risk for the entrepreneur, for the business owners. There are there's risk for the uh, lenders, for the investors. Uh, Fund Milwaukee specifically, we consulted a lawyer years years ago to make sure that we are merely the. Uh, the platform to introduce. Mm -hmm. We we give no endorsement of said product, service, investor, company, etc. But it does it does bring forward companies, entrepreneurs, services, products that may not have been highlighted otherwise. So I will see it more as an educational tool and investment or funding is just, you know, if that happens then that's just the cherry on top. But it's it's quite honestly a lot getting exposure and and I think you had said it Renee is learning to talk to people and, and cultivating the sales, learning to talk about yourself, spending so much time on selling yourself, your company, your idea. Um, and it's it's Milwaukee, we're casual. <laughs> we won't throw tomatoes at anyone. Um, but yeah, it's another great thing to check out. May I ask a follow up question? Of course. So, Dave, I'm curious about your thoughts on this because um, you were the one that brought up like market validation, right? Having a paying customer. If a, if a, if a tech company is pre product, but they've got a great concept, got it you know, mapped out in a bubble or Figma or whatever, but they don't have the money to go get the product developed, which is, you know, <laughs> touching on Todd's point of like lack of tech talent and tech talent being employed by companies on the coast, all that type of stuff. Would you see a big crowd investing around as some sort of market validation, particularly for a B2C company. Like, we don't have a product to sell yet, but we've sold the concept, and we have people putting their money behind it because they want the product. Mm -hmm. Is that, in, like, do you take that in consideration as a form of market validation? I, I would say yes, but I'd like to also see a lot of customer discovery. Data associated with you going out and asking questions of prospects, the ability to identify an ideal customer profile, and by that I mean a beachhead market, because most entrepreneurs that I see come to us with a boil the ocean idea. It's I'm, I'm going to sell toothbrushes in China. You know, there's a billion, well, you're not going to sell toothbrushes in China. Narrow that market down to exactly who is your beachhead. So that would be helpful, I think, but I'd like to see letters of intent and at least 100 prospect interviews where you've mm -hmm. documented who you've talked to and you can tell me what your ideal customer profile looks like. Scale down market validation. Again, he's, he's yeah. absolutely right. I want, I love to see that you're selling a product within the business model at the price point that you're selling this business and you have active customers. That's fantastic. <coughs> Sometimes you can't get to that point. All right, start scaling back that funnel. If you don't have 100 customers, do you have one or two? If you don't have one or two, do you have a bunch of LOIs? 
Do you have a bunch of LOIs? Do you have some key industry type relationships? Uh, you know, Dave and I are not that smart. We're investors, <laughs> right? But, but what he pointed out is he's got 99 other people. That, that he, was, he relies on. You don't have the industry people. You know, a lot of times it's not the business plan that gets the investment. It's the post-it on top of the business plan from the right person that says, read this. I think you should really take a hard look at this. If you can get 20 of his people to say, and they, they know the space, know what you're doing, to say, this is really, really interesting, the odds of him wanting to invest drastically went up, even though you don't have a customer, you don't have an LOI. Again, work it down to the best of your ability to, to provide the most advanced market validation that you can, and it'll increase your chances. How much money are you looking for? What's your ask? Oh, no, I'm more of like a, a conduit between entrepreneurs. I'm not raising money right now. Oh, okay. Um, just, that's always a question, because okay. crowdfunding has, has been yeah. something that's surfaced as of late, particularly because there's a culture, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with, it's the same thing that you guys are talking about, the, the bank culture, but we won't yeah. touch that, right. you know, it's not bankable. There's the, the kind of overwhelming um, like kind of thought of, you know, maybe there's a bit more of risk aversion mm -hmm. from the non-traditional financing realm of particularly scalable tech startups. Um, and, well, sometimes crowdfunding or crowd investing in the funder republic is like kind of your last stop. Like, yep. if, if, if there's not a community of people around the country that want this, then maybe it's time to kill the baby. Yeah. But okay. we, we make bets on concepts for sure, but you have to have done your homework. And by doing your homework, I mean product market fit as defined by, I've narrowed the market down. It's not all the people in China who have teeth I'm selling brush, toothbrushes to. I've narrowed it down to my ideal customer profile. So who is my customer? What can I do for my customer, which is a value proposition, something you can, a problem you can really solve, and then thirdly, how do I make money doing that? If you've narrowed this down and really done your homework and have at least 100 customer interviews, prospects, we would make a bet. Uh, Go ahead, Rochelle. Um, it's a given that it's a little um, Getting the knowledge out there is a big thing. I only know two of these people on here. Like, right. I've been in business and right. an entrepreneur for a while. Um, through the Great Milwaukee Foundation and the LRC, I've got funding to it. I've got a loan for it. I really don't need a loan. I need to go out credit. Mm -hmm. I was one of the people in the Business Journal article because we've been having a hard time getting this line of credit. Banks like US Bank put out this, you know, we're helping minority businesses. They put out a whole program, put all of these things on there, requirements, things like that. Um, I know three people, we all met these criteria that's on paper. We still didn't get it. Um, we asked the reason why. We got different responses. Um, I dug deeper. I contacted higher ups. It was like, you know, you guys had this. They baited us in, you know, saying, oh, just do it, you know, run our credit, this brings our credit down. Now, you know, that dings us, that's a hard pull. Um, it went all the way up to like the program manager. So they sent me another <laughs> list of things. One of them said, um, you don't have any bank sources, so we can't give you this. But that's what we're trying to do. We met your criteria. It tell us we don't have any bank sources, <laughs> so we can't. So it's like, what's happening there? Um, so I'm just like, now listening to you guys, this puts me in another position. Now I can reach out you know, to this. I didn't want to go through with it for the loan or line of credit, because that interest rate is ridiculous for a small business. Um, <laughs> I just didn't want to do it. Um, we went to the people program with Renee, really good with all that thing. And that was with other business though. Um, but as my business, Crane City Print Lounge, um, the first year we did, we opened right before the pandemic. Um, so we did like 40,000 in the first year. The year of the pandemic, we made 380 pay in sales. Who do you make with? <laughs> we still we made profit, we keep making profits. 
but we're still not bankable for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, some banks like, oh, you need five years. You need three years five years. And like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, but now, like coming to this, I know there's other resources. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll look into this. But to go back, like, how do we get this information to minority business owners, any small business owners that's trying to get out there? Um, because I haven't heard, like I said, I'm trying to two of these mm -hmm. until today, so. You give them my cell phone number. <laughs> <laughs> Like, well, yeah, go ahead. well I, would, I would love to work with you and help you. I mean, as has been right. said here, I mean, having that right post-it note on that business plan mm -hmm. makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the traditional channels, and I've, I've been on both sides. Let me say that. I've been a business owner, business owner for over 25 years, and I understand the difference between walking and going in through the traditional channels especially as a minority, and going around the channel difference. And, you know, that is a problem a lot of minorities have. They, they have programs out there, but the programs, quite honestly, some of them are for show. Yes. But there are funds out there, and there are genuine people in this community are, that are willing to help. And, you know, that, that's been one of the things that I've been trying to do in my role is to, to meet those people that are generally trying to help, um, especially people of color, um, in finding financing. And, and, and I tell them, when I meet them, like, hey, you know, I don't want to waste my client's time. Mm -hmm. So if this program's not for real, you know, I'm not, you know, I don't want to be bothered with it. If it's, you know, if, you, if you're going to do something legitimate and, and you're trying to help um, our businesses scale and grow, you know, I will work with you and I will find you qualified people because that's what you really need. I mean, there, and, and I mentioned earlier about the lack of uh, minority financial institutions. Um, that's, that's part of the problem. When we had those in the, in the community, um, you saw businesses that were able to scale because they had, they took the mentality of, we're gonna do the exact same thing for our community as the bigger banks are doing for their community. And it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that thing is getting to know you and having a relationship. I heard Renee ask the question, who do you bank with? Because as a business owner that have went, you know, in one year you went from 40,000 to 380,000, that banker should know you. That banker should be coming to you asking what you need to do, what, how they can help you because that is how they are supposed to make money. Right. And the fact that you're doing those type, have those types of sales and don't have a relationship, that's a problem. But it's not your problem, it's their problem, and there's ways around it. It's a great point. And as you remember in the SPARK program, of which you went through, Rashad, mm -hmm. that you enjoyed so much, twice, twice, twice so much that you liked it. Uh, and I actually think it's next week's um, uh, session in Spark is talking with Tracy Meeks of Old National Bank, who he has, he, oh, it's like a sound bite now that he's, he's a good one. If you are not meeting with your banker regularly, you need to fire your banker. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I feel like that is a thing well, we've realized today. And, and part of it too is it is, somebody talked about, you talked about your client running away and, and being like right. scared. I mean, I have talked to you and many other people who are like, ah, I don't want to because we're like, what'd you do? Why don't you do this? You know, we don't mean to be like, voila. And we try to get it as patient as we are. We're like, okay, I understand. I'm, I'll come back. So, you know, just kind of go both ways. Make sure that if you don't, you know, your client wasn't avoiding you because he wasn't doing a good business. He was avoiding you because he was like, oh shit, what's going on? You know, and what, what can I, so, but then when you guys talked, you're like, oh, okay. Wait, they owe me money. So, I mean, having those great, you know, we've had some good, relate. you know, it's like, okay, how do we really cut through this? Right. And then you, you know, you got to that with your customer. You'll get to that with a banker, a community banker, or somebody with Greg on your side, you know. And that's what we happen, because we end up um, having to change our bank, and because yeah. they wouldn't work with us, and as we started talking, um, we end up, after getting all our stuff together, um, a banker came to us. Right. Mm -hmm. So now we have a personal banker that's handling 
all our affairs and mm -hmm. I call her and I need something, she's right there and you know, there's no I'm just going there. Here's his own here we at. I need to take care of this and That's cool. it's, it's taken care of. Right? And we all have that those kinds of things that we have to just get over or yourselves. I mean I, I have, we all have that. That we're like, okay, I'm gonna try again. Mm -hmm. you know, whatever happens. And one thing that the scale up team noticed and that uh, one thing that was highlighted during the pandemic and the distribution of the PPP loans was just how important that banking relationship is. If you look at the data, and I don't have it in front of me, so don't quote me, but an overwhelming amount of PPP loan recipients, White it was men. because they had, and it was a lot because they had a personal relationship with their banker. They. One thing that Scale Up prides ourselves on is that when we, when when Lyndon calls us and say we we need we need new financing, we need a traditional bank loan, I say um, call call John at Waukesha State Bank, call Tracy at Old National, call you know Joaquin when he was at Town Bank. Um, you know, it's not just go to Chase. It's go to this guy. Here's his email. Um, again, those relationships, especially in small Waukee really, really pay off.